Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar, co-hosted by the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy's Innovation Policy Lab and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. My name is Matt Lundy, and as you can see, well, you can't really see me right now, so hopefully that, that uh, changes over the course of our discussion. I'm an economics reporter at the Globe and Mail and will be moderating today's uh, discussion. Today, we're going to be talking about the future of decent work after the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to encourage those watching to submit any questions they might have. Please email, tweet, or write us in Zoom's Q&A field. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Dan Bresnitz, uh, he's co-director um, at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research's program on innovation, equity, and the future of prosperity. Uh, he is the co-director of the Monk School's Innovation Policy Lab, as well as Monk Chair of Innovation Studies and a professor at U of T's Monk School and within the Department of Political Science. We also have Zabine Herji, Global Advisor for the Future of Work Program at Deloitte, and she is also the former Chief Human Resources Officer at the Royal Bank of Canada. Finally, we have Peter Warian. He is a distinguished fellow at the Monk School, uh, a former research director at the United Steelworkers of America, and the former chief economist of the province of Ontario. So let's get started. Now, uh, it, it's right in the title that coronavirus is, is certainly going to be part of the discussion and it's looming large on everyone's mind here. Um, obviously the pandemic has inflicted uh, record setting damage on Canada's job market. Millions of jobs have been lost. Uh, millions have seen their work hours significantly reduced, often to zero and millions more are working from home for the first time. Um, you know, I'll start with Zabine here. Um, if we fast forward five or 10 years, what are going to be some of the most significant changes to the workplace that resulted from the pandemic? And conversely, what might look very similar at the workplace as before the pandemic? Um, thank you, uh, Matt, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think, you know, you've certainly, you've set it up well in, in many ways. Um, I think looking, the, the, the pandemic has fast forwarded the future of work already. Some of the things that we anticipated to take um, five years have actually happened overnight. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk about two specific, uh, two specific areas. And I think one thing that we all know is that technology is really uh, one of the key drivers of the changes to the future of work. And we were already on a path um, prior to the pandemic, but that too has been accelerated uh, where we, I think, will continue to see digitization and automation uh, continue to accelerate. And one of the things that I would want to point out here is uh, sometimes we fall into this mindset of um, technological determinism. Um, it's really important that we work together across all of the sectors, business, government, academia, labor, um, social um, um, organization, social sector, and workers to ensure that technology is actually being used to make work more human um, and that we need to create our own destiny. And sometimes I think the conversation sort of falls to where um, it's technology that's determining that. But as I think about uh, the, the, the five to 10 year question that, uh, that you're talking about, uh, I think the biggest uh, areas where we're really gonna have to build capacity is the ability to reskill and upskill um, almost in real time, the half-life of knowledge continues to get shorter and shorter. Um, and so this doubling down on, um, on upskilling and reskilling is something that I think needs to enter into our conversations and actions more. Certainly as we've reacted and responded to, uh, to COVID, there are some uh, very critical uh, basic needs that have had to be addressed up front. Uh, even pre-COVID, uh, pre the World Economic Forum had done a study that showed that 54% of workers are going to have to reskill and upskill significantly in the next three years. 
Uh, there are many studies of, of that nature and you know you can argue the numbers but they're large um, and and so we don't really have a, a model in place uh, at organizational levels but at the really at, at the macro level as well at the country level to be um, upskilling and reskilling so that our uh, employees and workers can actually move into the new jobs that are going to be created um, through the uh, automation as opposed to fall out of the labor market. And what I would also want to point out there in terms of skills, uh, I think we all talk about the digital skills and the importance of digital fluency. And certainly we're seeing that now um, as, uh, as we work from home and are, are using new tools. But it's really, I would also point out the, what's often called human skills, um, or I, I should call them power skills, and that's uh, critical thinking, problem solving, empathy, collaboration. A lot of the, um, those are the enduring skills and those actually help us apply uh, knowledge in new ways. And you know, the skills conversation I would close off with um, they really are the new currency. Skills are the new currency in the future of work. But so it's learning. The capacity to learn is something that needs to, to be a huge priority for us. The second point I would make in terms of what's going to be different is where work is done. We have seen uh, through the pandemic, um, 5 million people are working from home. Uh, that was the Statistics Canada uh, numbers from mid-April, and that was up from 1.7 million pre-pandemic. So that's over 40% of the workforce. I am very uh, uh, aware that that means 60% of the workforce is not working from home. There are many jobs that cannot be done from elsewhere. You have to uh, be in the office or in the plant or, or in, in another physical location. And what we're seeing there, uh, we are hearing, I, I speak to a lot of uh, workers, a lot of leaders, and there's a lot of uh, positives that are coming out of there. You know, time, uh, time with family, no commute, able to integrate um, physical activity. I can go for my run at lunchtime. Um, and people feeling they are more productive, it's good for the environment. On the flip side, we're also hearing things uh, like, uh, isolation, um, how do we, there's a, we as humans have connected physically forever. Um, a lot happens, innovation, um, ideas, relationships. So in my view, we are going to land at a place where there's a blend of working from home and working from, uh, uh, from physical locations where people come together. And those may well be um, the locations may well be more spread out, but I do see more people working from home. And, but within that context of a blend of where we're actually coming into, uh, into a common physical space. And that's a whole area, a whole new area for us to really figure out how we make that work. Um, it's not about just flipping a switch. Having said that, it's really quite remarkable how people have adjusted to that new environment. And, and what it's showing us there is the capacity we have to learn. We are you know, united in common predicament, common purpose, uh, and we've really been able to uh, bring out um, you know, the, the human capacity to learn as individuals and to learn together. And what makes me hopeful is how can we harness that mindset, that capacity uh, to help us become a nation of learners. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter or Dan, did you have any uh, thoughts on, on where we may end up as far as well, you know, what the future workplace looks like, say, 10 years down the road? Well, I think that um, what we've got revealed is the great inequities um, uh, that have revealed uh, in what the way it's unfolded socially and economically um, because we've got the effect of COVID and then underneath that we've got the longer term challenges of, of, uh, of, of uh, the digital transformation from AI robotics and such and I think already uh, when you can see um, a number of, of uh, these new technologies 3D printing 
uh, AI and others have had a prominent role uh, in just dealing with the COVID. Now, does that accelerate uh, the underlying thing or is it in some ways it does, some ways it doesn't. I think from what we're seeing right now, there is a danger of a um, two digital economies. That is, at, 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 in using uh, the language of all those technologies sometimes being referred to as Industry 4.0, uh, where you upskill the workers, you use all the digital technologies. And on that, the latest research is saying, okay, what do employers want for employees in these high-tech uh, manufacturing workplace like the global auto industry? Because how you make a car in Canada and Korea, et cetera, is about the same. And what they found at the end of the day is what the uh, employers want and need from their workforces are ability uh, to communicate, learn, take risks, collaborate, and uh, the language is increasingly used is those are civic virtues. Well, that's, that's you know, I'm, I'm an advisor of the Vatican. That's an interesting piece of news because you begin uh, with a discussion of technology and engineering and at the end, an industrial organization. But at the end of the day, you have a discussion about uh, our moral natures. Because certainly in Francis's view, the COVID is not only a health and economic cruel challenge, but it ultimately tests our ethical and social capacities. And that's why uh, that's really important. So the upside is that uh, those new workplaces, employers need that different kind of workforce and different kind of engagement. But we can also see at the lower end, increasingly, the new monitoring technologies and surveillance technologies are used, uh, tracking of working people, getting social security benefits, insurance, uh, your public entitlements, welfare compliance. That becomes digitized in an, I think, oppressive way. So there is this potential. It's not for the reasons stated by the previous speaker, just the technology itself, but how it's used. And we run the risk in terms of the labor market of two digital economies, a 4.0, if you like, high road, and a lower risk of constant surveillance with the implication of, of discipline behind those. That's what I would be concerned about. Dan, uh, you, you deal a lot with uh, companies that are in the, you know, what we might call the innovation economy. Uh, certainly, we've seen, um, you know, Shopify uh, uh, is not going to be opening its offices this year, um, you know, a lot of other company, tech companies as well. Um, and, you know, Twitter has said, uh, we'll, we'll allow employees to work from home forever. Um, Shopify expects the majority of its employees to work from home permanently. Um, are, are there, what sort of risks are there for, for companies, for innovative companies um, in having their employees in, in such disparate areas? So first of all, um, let me uh, thank everybody here, but um, I would say that this is part of a problem. So let's start with the high end already established businesses. Uh, they might be able to do that, especially for employees that have already been part of the organization, that already know the other people they work with. They're already, if you want to have the culture of the organization. Um, what we do now, for example, the webinar is built on the social trust and the ability to work together through Zoom that we have created by working together for five or six years. So I don't need to see Peter uh, that much anymore. I can, it's not the same, but I can still do things on Zoom. If I had to create something like the Innovation Policy Lab in the university or a startup, which I did in the past, and I had to meet people that I did not know before, and I had to make them into the funding team, that will be a very tall order, okay? That's one. The second, which I think is as important, is as we have those technologies coming in, before and after COVID. And here I see COVID as, as, as Zabin have said, it sort of accelerates, but it doesn't change. Um, I am less worried about, uh, you know, the number of jobs for people, but I'm really worried about the number of decent jobs for people and who are those people. 
So Peter can tell you that right now in British Columbia, we have a world uh, most automated and high tech copper mine and actually employs more people than were employed before, but none of them are miners. And all of them have really high, uh, what you will call IT skills, innovation skills, because what they really do is to make sure that those supposedly smart machine actually work. Uh, if I look at it, however, this sounds great, but then I look at it and I said, so who are those people? Those are not the same people who worked there before. The people who we work for uh, producing cars are not the people that worked there before. Um, what happened to those people? And if you talk about an uh, uh, economy like Canada, where we have a lot of natural resources, again, the example of the mine, those people do not uh, or are not part of the local communities. Um, that's where I start to be worried. So the rate of change, who is employed in what kind of jobs, and then there's the last thing, and that is who makes this decision. Uh, I used to read a lot of science fiction in the 70s and 80s as a young boy, and I just came back to it uh, to see what people thought about it. And what is really disturbing is how chauvinistic it is, not just by the fact that it's mostly written by white males, which thought white males are great, but that they basically divided humanities into two, the people who uh, produce technologies and uh, one offer even call them the herd. What is really worrying me <laughs> is that the titans of high tech at Silicon Valley are also avid readers of this science fiction and those are the stories that form in their mind how they're building societies so what i'm really worried about is who has voice in deciding how do we employ and develop those technologies and i'm not sure we are in a good path that's my worry hmm. uh, uh, we're starting to get some uh great questions already. Um, I, I wanted to direct one to Zabine here. Um, uh, one of our participants, uh, Tammy Chan, has asked, will you anticipate uh, the appointment status and benefits package to be different with a job based at home? And just to, you know, before we get into that, um, some of us may have seen uh, that Facebook uh, recently, uh, there's certainly more open to people working from home, but compensation would be different. Obviously, if you're in uh, the Bay Area, uh, you, you need to be paid quite a lot to live there. But you know, if you're in Iowa, let's say, uh, they could pay you considerably less. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, will you anticipate the appointment status and benefits package to be different with a job based at home? Um, uh, thank you, Matt. Now, I'm going to interpret the appointment status as being related to the, the career trajectory, and, and maybe that can be clarified while I answer the, uh, the, the benefits question. Um, so, you know, in terms of will the benefits package be different working from home, um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think so, uh, but what I would say there is benefits packages need to be more and more flexible because one size doesn't fit all. And um, there are still packages that are very much built around the traditional uh, family, the, the traditional uh, married couple um, and people with kids. And so I, what I really see is this continuing drive to, um, to personalize packages more so that they are um, um, they, they really meet the needs of employees at that particular time of their, of their lives. Um, and the other thing that I would say, which we haven't touched on, but we certainly are seeing the, the rise of issues in, uh, of mental health issues. This is not a new issue. This is something that, again, pre-COVID uh, was certainly uh, prevalent. You know, statistics like one in five Canadians will uh, will experience a mental health issue every year. Uh, Deloitte did a study that uh, estimated the cost of poor mental health in the workplace to be $50 billion a year. 
uh, 500,000 employees um, per week unable to work uh, due to mental health issues. And COVID has really, um, again, has really accelerated that people are dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, and, uh, and that's not expected to change once we go back to the office. It is really expected to be an issue for quite some time. So I would expect that uh, benefits packages will pay more attention and will make changes so that there is more support, um, not just through the, the financial support of uh, benefits packages, but also around workplace culture and how employees are supported through that. And like many of these, uh, uh, many of these issues that we're talking about, this is a win-win. This is the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. So if I go back to the, the question around appointments and, and, and I'm gonna, as I say, I'm interpreting that really as around um, career opportunities. Um, and um, I certainly think that that's one of the adjustments that organizations will be making. Um, and, and really moving away from, because people worry about that. If I work from home, I'm going to be out of sight, out of mind. What does that mean to my career um, and my career opportunities and, 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 the, and the appointments? Uh, and we're going to have to move more and more towards measuring people's um, output, people's outcome and the impact that they're having. And one of the positives that can actually come from that, if we get good at uh, measuring performance and productivity uh, in, in that way, in, in more uh, objective ways, it can actually drive to a more inclusive um, outcome where people have uh, more, there's more inclusion around opportunities for people because it's not based on um, some of the um, some of the, the more subjective measures. Uh, so that's a hope that I would have around working in, in this distributed work fashion where we can get better at actually assessing people's impact, capability, and performance. We're, we're getting quite a lot of questions here from, uh, I suspect, uh, current students or, or recent graduates. Um, you know, obviously this is a, an extremely difficult time for one to be graduating in. Um, Peter, I'd like to start with you on, on this question. Um, you know, uh, you know how, how is a home-based job market, if that's what we're looking at, you know, for, for a while here, especially for, for white collar jobs, um, how is a home-based job market um, going to affect new graduates? And how could new graduates highlight their skills in a more virtual environment? Well, I think that the, um, there's, I think new graduates have had difficulties getting in, if you like. You can have general education, but having the skills, uh, and how do you get that first up? I think that is probably going to become more difficult because the kind of sort of, I don't mean this in a demeaning sense, entry level jobs where people go into an organization and, and get into that milieu. You learn the culture of the organization. It's difficult to do that uh, if you're not in the workplace ever or, or, or very little. So there would have to be uh, an adaptation which brings people in for a certain amount of time that if you like enables them. And so just having the, the educational skills by itself, I don't think is enough. Just having the digital skills, I don't think will be enough. I think that um, number one, uh, the how the actual work processes take place is actually much more complicated, and it's the culture of an organization, even within a single industry, uh, may be very different. It's difficult to to learn that by long distance. So, whether or not I know it's not the great word, but an internship style of thing to get exposed to the work processes and such to enable you to effectively um, you know, work, quote, at home or largely at home. That would be one challenge. Secondly, something that may come up initially negative, but could be become um, uh, 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 positive over time, if people are smart about it, is that we're in the sort of gee golly whiz state of working at home, all right? Well, I think if this becomes the new normal where, you know, 
you know, as, as Zabin said, you know, you know, half the workforce something. I think inevitably employers are going to in, uh, want to impose monitoring technology. They can always already monitor long distance your keystrokes <laughs> and, and, and what you're doing when working at home. So this is going to become an issue. Now you can say it enables greater feedback in a, a progressive human resource environment. But I think the next stage of this, when we get by the G Golly whiz, is going to be uh, a, a, a large uh, and contentious discussion about the um, uh, new means of monitoring and, to say it directly, surveillance, and to what degree that is a, an enabling function and what degree a coaching function or what it might be actually a potentially a disciplinary function. Danny might want to add on to some of that. Sure. Um, yes, exactly. That's why I said who has uh, the ability to decide what technology to use, how to employ people, what are their rights. So uh, to um, work on the question that was there before, I'll be slightly less worried about the benefit package. I will be much more worried on the string attached and what kind of technologies you are allowing your employers to actually bring to your private house in order to monitor you, see what you're doing on the computer. And once you know they're in with a camera and a phone and a voice and a microphone and a various other stuff and software and application on your computer and smartphone, where is the end and where is the separation? Um, what is private, what is not, what is work, what is not, what is legal, what is not. What happens when uh, your employer or an officer of that employer uh, trespass the boundary, which is now very ambiguous about what is allowed and not allowed. Uh, those are questions we don't even know. I wouldn't say we don't even know how to answer. We don't even ask. And that's where I'm worried about. Um, and uh, as a professor, by the way, who was a very young professor, but saw the, the, the 2008 crash and the jobs and what happened before that, uh, not only my heart is with the new graduates, um, but I think it behooves not just the universities, but uh, in Canada where all universities are public, it behooves all of us, uh, including government, to think about how we deal with people who just start their career. And if they start it in the wrong place, it will have impact on their whole career life. And second, if this is indeed accelerating changes to the workplace, and where here Zabine, I think, knows more than any one of us, can we now think about a year or two before this labor market really opens up? How do we train, but also retrain uh, the many people who now are at home and are very willing to be retrained if there was an opportunity to retrain? Um, and that's where I would suggest we start uh, working and thinking about and implementing really, really quickly because it will be a kind of experiment. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in there, uh, Matt? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. Yeah, there are um, um, a couple of things. You know, we talked about uh, new graduates and uh, one possible um, research study opportunity. Uh, many of the Canadian, um, the, the large companies, certainly many of the banks, have gone ahead uh, with, their, uh, with their summer student hirings. Um, you know, there's between all of the banks alone, there's and and the and the consulting firms, there's uh, probably five thousand, um, and it would be and of course they're all being um, onboarded and uh, and and working virtually, and it would be an, an interesting study to um, to really glean from there um, some of the, the the learnings and things that uh, that we could use moving forward. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, Dan, your point around this retraining and reskilling, we need to move the conversation to there more. 
Um, and this is about a hand up as opposed to hand out. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm not being critical at all. I think the governments have come in and exactly, you know, really address people's immediate needs. But we now have all this idle capacity. We have millions of people that are, um, that have the, the, the time and the opportunity to actually reskill, retrain, and move up their skill level to a whole new level for the new jobs that will be created. They will not be going, many of them will not be going back into the jobs that exist today because some of them won't exist, we'll see more automation, more digitization. And to me, that's a coming together across all of the sectors as we have during the pandemic we have seen more collaboration than ever before and how are we going to lead um, to to really um, get you know uh, be ready for that uh, post-pandemic um, economy um, I think is is a is an area that we don't have time we we need to uh, we really need to move into that mode um, and there's a huge human benefit and uh, social benefit from that as well when people are engaged in uh, in productive work or uh, productive learning. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, uh, I wanted to direct something to you, uh, another uh, question that we've received um, in light um, This question from Dan Monroe says, presumably the future of work will still include a high number of less desirable jobs, for example, certain kinds of service work cleaning, even as we generate and prepare people for new decent or better jobs. What, if anything, can we do to make the less desirable jobs and the lives of the people who hold them better? Well, uh, it is very clear that some jo jobs are more desirable than others, but it's interesting Every politician on the planet has been uh, making wonderful speeches on how we all appreciate and recognize the contribution of care workers from nurses to sanitary workers. Well, you could begin by giving them decent pay and decent benefits, neither of which they now have. Uh, and I might remind people if you're in Ontario, this is a big round of hospital bargaining coming up, harvest of service workers, and union leaders will be remembering all of the speeches on how we need to organize and recognize uh, the poor paid who delivered, yeah, as I said, from the nurse to the sanitation worker, and we could begin by giving them the kind of, of wages and benefits uh, they, uh, they really deserve. And the most tragic example, of course, is the nursing homes, where we've had you know, a, an active policy that people don't earn enough, earn enough money, where they have to move around between jobs just to even try to make ends meet and they become a, a conveyor belt for, for the virus. So I think you could begin by them getting, uh, recognizing and fulfilling the current political rhetoric about how valuable their work uh, is and make, make those jobs a better environment, at least from working conditions to wages and benefits. I would start there. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, I, uh, we've had a lot of talk about uh, skills here and, and how imperative it is uh, to reskill people for the future. Um, if you were uh, a younger person getting into the job market now, um, you know, I guess one, how, how, uh, how do you even know what those skills are and what sort of training you need? And beyond that, what, what sort of role does government play in, in helping to um, you know, uh, facilitate that matching for, uh, for employees and skills? Oh, so uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, it's a really good question, partly because we did a research in the Innovation Policy Lab a few years ago, um, and what we found out is that most companies didn't, two things happened. A, they didn't really know what skills they need, so they had this aspiration about skills, and uh, sentences were very complicated but in the end of the day um, it was short basically IT proficiency uh, what Peter called civic values but even more importantly they had a very hard time in judging uh, who of our employees or prospects actually had those skills because if you look at the people already working them they 
in those organizations that had those skills, but they were underappreciated. So if you want to be a slightly cynical person, which I think you should under this environment, uh, one of the things that you really need to think about is not just the skills, but is the signaling device. So if I want to work in those set of companies and the skills that they claim that they want are X, Y, and Z, how do I signal to those companies that I have uh, those skills? One of the things that uh, we know people do is uh, go to college, and especially good colleges, uh, to programs that know how to signal that. Um, so if you're a really cynical person, uh, one of the first things that I will do right now is to figure out whether you can get a diploma or a degree that will signal to your future employee what skills you have, uh, and especially what potential you have. Uh, because right now, I do not believe that the employers actually know what skills they're looking for because the technology is changing so fast. Uh, the second, uh, which I highly recommend, especially to my own students if they listen, is throughout this training and retraining, try to do short projects that will show an effective uses of those skills. Because when I had the company and, and somebody looked at the CV and the CV was basically a list of courses, if it was a programmer, I knew what I'm hiring. But if it's not a programmer, uh, I would look for something else. For example, a project with a professor. Um, an internship, which was more than, you know, I just sat and sat and drank coffee at the embassy in Thailand, um, but real meaningful short projects. Um, proof of potential, if you will, especially of skills that I don't know how to define, either as a student or as a professor, and definitely as an employee. So the employee, uh, the younger Zabine, would be, oh, this is an interesting CV. It shows skills, especially show potential to develop skills. I'm willing to bet on that person. Uh, and that I will highly recommend all my students and anyone who retrain and have time, if they have time on their hands now, is to think about signaling devices, uh, projects, papers, whatever, that would allow employers that can be more selective to figure out what skills you really have and not just what diplomas you have or you don't have. Uh, we are getting uh, quite a few questions about uh, work from home arrangements and remote work, um, as you can imagine right now, given that a lot of, well, we're all doing it, uh, for those uh, who fortunately have work right now. Uh, there's a question from Kevin here that I thought was great and I was hoping Zabine could uh, weigh in on. Um, he asked, what are your thoughts on cultivating and creating culture and engagement with a distributed workforce? What key things should organizations be doing now to foster that? That's a great question. In fact, I just uh, came off a, a call this morning where we were um, discussing it uh, with, uh, with a couple of employers. Um, it, and, and I think, um, you know, uh, Dan, you touched on the importance of culture as well when, when, you, were, uh, when you were speaking about that. So it, the, in terms of the, the, the remote en environments or, or working from home, I think we're, we're, this question starts with the assumption that um, culture is, uh, is created um, just through physical connection. And, I, and, it, and that is a in my view, that is still going to be required um, in some way. Um, but you know, if you think about, for example, uh, and culture is simply behaviors. It's it's how you know how you act um, when nobody's looking, and it's it's really the, the the norms and 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 how things happen. So, for example, if you are looking to create uh, a, a a culture of 
and, and I'm going to use, in fact, the example we were talking about this morning was a, around a culture of well-being. One of the things we're hearing about work from home is people are actually working longer. There was a study that Bloomberg put out that said people are working about three hours longer. And the boundaries between work and, um, and the rest of your life are actually harder to, uh, to maintain. And so, you know, there was a leader there who said, well, we've actually established that we are not, um, we are not, we're going to do calls between nine and five. Now, of course, occasionally things change, but the core behaviors, we're going to set aside Tuesday morning or whatever day, and we're not going to, you can use that, you know, that's time for your own personal work, but we're not going to have meetings. So leaders really set the tone in terms of, um, of what those behaviors are and, and, and what those norms are that they want to establish. Uh, in the same way, a, a lot happens through communicating, engaging with the groups, engaging one-on-one, -on -one, but you do have to take very deliberate actions. I think that's the, uh, that's the important point um, in order to nurture and, um, and, and to build uh, the culture. But you know, it's too soon to tell. We've, we've been at this for three months in, in unusual circumstances. Uh, so we have to continue to, to learn. There are sensing mechanisms that can be used to, uh, to get feedback from employees real time, frequently, um, around culture and around some of those behaviors. And I would say that leaders need, are going to need to spend more time right now um, around that particular part uh, of, of their roles. Um, if I could just go to your to, to Dan's point around this whole ethical aspect of and monitoring, etc. On the flip side, a lot of the, the employers that I'm speaking with are very, um, you know, they are not moving in that direction. They're really looking to see it's got to be based on trust to some extent. You need data, but I think the data should be for individuals so that it can be used because at the end of the day, people want to be productive. Um, but the biggest part, which has actually, it's not just related to remote work, is to reframe performance and productivity from inputs and how much time is the person spending on the job to what are the results, what are the outputs, and what are the outcomes. Whether it takes them three hours to do it or seven hours to do it actually is not a measure of, uh, of, of the performance, but that's what we're used to. I will say to people, so if someone's sitting at their desk working away, you're assuming they're being productive. Uh, FaceTime is not uh, a substitute for productivity. That's a huge, huge uh, mindset um, shift and in some ways you know maybe as academics you are actually perhaps more at the model of the the outputs and the outcomes where um, there are you know, clear and accepted measures of success and that's what's used um, so um, on the you know the flip side I, I organizations are very worried uh, about this the whole kind of tracking and monitoring it is not a long-term uh, sustainable solution. I wanted to uh, throw uh, quickly to Dan because he has some thoughts about, uh, about the whole work from home thing as well. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about working from home. I think the one uh, very clear is that we all live in Toronto and have very good broadband so we can work from home. If I look just in Canada, I'm not talking about the globe. Many of my friends in the north of Ontario uh, will find it difficult to even have half a Zoom hour for one of her kids to maybe see a grainy picture of her teacher. We are not prepared for an economy of working and studying from home. And this is Canada. I don't, I shudder to think about the world. Second, uh, we actually know um, how organizations work. Uh, and there's studies among studies among studies, uh, actually about gender, for example, in high tech companies, so that I know very well, 
uh, that what happens to the career pattern of a lot of females is as soon as they have kids, they are working as hard as before, but they don't come early. They don't stay and have beer and coffee or soda or pizzas until midnight. Uh, and usually it's the female who used to uh, who decide or somebody decide for them to go home. And what you see is that in their management career, they start to go down. Uh, and I can also think about very many organizations in the US, um, software companies that I, I, I can't tell you, but they all fortune 1000 companies. We do employ a lot of my ex-friends from MIT, from home, throughout their life. But it is very clear what is the career pattern of those people. They are not going to higher management, ever. At best, they can be a team manager. But unless they are coming to the office and do politics and do management and do admin, those organizations, at least in the past, have not trusted them to become real leaders. So if you ever want to be in the C office, uh, I would suggest that you figure out a way that you, in which you are not just working from home. Um, on the positive side of it, uh, as uh, my friend Paul Baker had uh, remarked, we have been using telecommunication and working from home uh, to engage with a lot of people with disabilities and get them into the labor market. People find it very difficult to go. Uh, so there's positive about that. Um, but I have to say that right now, if indeed this is going to be a long term, which I'm not sure it is, by the way, if we ever find a vaccine, those who will work from home need to be aware as to the negative uh, influence it might have on their career if they ever want to lead. The companies and the second is it's very nice to talk about it when you're in toronto montreal vancouver uh, there's a lot of canadian and a lot of people in around the globe who just doesn't have inter, don't have infrastructure to ever work from home so if this is something that as a country you think that you need to have it is time that we build the infrastructure those are great points, Dan. Uh, Peter, I wanted to uh, get a question over to you. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left here. Uh, there was one that came in uh, last night that I think would be great for you. Um, it reads, given that many economies have been crushed under the financial weight of the lockdown, both in terms of job losses, small business closures, and massive amounts of state debt, will the labor force have to adjust to a new reality of chronic unemployment and having to take jobs the government deems as essential over ones that match their skills, talents, and desires? Well, I, I think that, as I said, those, quote, less desirable jobs need to be redressed in terms of the conditions of work and the, 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 um, the uh, compensation package, that sort of stuff. I think more, more broadly, uh, it's not going to be I mean, we don't know exactly how all this is going to play out, but if you have to call it right now, um, we have run up uh, very large expenditures, a huge amount of debt. Now, if you're a country, uh, and but governments can, in the advanced country, they, they can borrow at a half a percent, very low interest rates for a long, long time, but the bill ultimately has to get paid one way or the other. You can inflate it away. You can try to grow your way out of it. But it will raise the issue of, of taxation. Uh, count on it. Uh, Canada has a large health bill. The health bill is going to go up. If only just to redress the question of the elderly and the nursing homes and all that sort of stuff. I think the um, going forward, uh, my economic call is actually fairly, fairly uh, simple. The major determinants of what happens next are going to be debt and food. Uh, I think there will be jobs, but what kinds of jobs indeed goes back to the decent work question. So I don't think a total ad, uh, the absence of jobs is going to be an issue, but whether or not there's decent jobs, 
uh, with de decent conditions because there's a risk in this underneath the digitization stuff, the working from home, is that we're gonna have a reinforcement of a core working force and a peripheral working force. They may have both jobs, but there may be quote jobs, but there will be that maldistribution, if you like, around decent work. So I think the equity, the equality issue comes up big time. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's one that I, one last thing here, because we have to wrap up in about six minutes, but uh, there's a point that Hans made uh, in the comments that I thought was really great. And I was hoping that all of you could, you know, maybe weigh in for, uh, you know, under 60 seconds on this. But um, he mentioned that, you know, if, if we are heading toward a more permanent work from home situation for a lot of companies, um, does that create a potential issue where outsourcing becomes more common and you know a more common accepted business practice you know we've seen this in manufacturing before but if you're a software developer in toronto who can do their work from home why not send that job to india or thailand or south america or wherever um and uh hans asks is canada in a good place if that future uh takes place maybe dan you could start off with that Sure, I'll just tell you that in IT and especially in software, that has happened before. Um, indeed, I have followed several companies that were created after uh, Nokia, remember that wonderful company, crashed, where the uh, structure was that the management and business development was in the US. Uh, and then they hired all the Finnish software engineers because the Finnish software engineers, the best, wanted 60,000 euros. And you can imagine how much a software programmer in Silicon Valley wanted. So that's nothing new. But again, the reason it worked is because they all worked together in that company called Nokia before and could trust to do that even from the time of the start. What really worries me is, I think, the underlying question. Um, and instead of that, I'll say, uh, are we going to see the lift of, or Uberization or the Amazon Turks of all works? And as a political economist, what worries me here is that we have designed our whole society, and it's still designed, as if we have a corporation with one jobs that come through all our life. Through that, we get the benefits, we get various things. If we move to a world where 85% of us are uh, time-limited contractors on specific jobs. How do we de deal with pensions, benefits, training, health, and all the rest? And that is a question that I have not seen very good answer for, nor do I've seen any sophisticated debate. But again, I might be wrong here, and Sabine and Peter, who, who deals with it much more on a daily basis, no of a good discussion. Sabine, maybe you could uh, weigh in on this as well. Um, Dan has covered a lot. And uh, just maybe to bring one additional point into this conversation, I think what it also means um, is that Canadians and Canadian talent become open to the global market. Um, and in particular to the U.S. market, where uh, while we have had, had Canadians move there, a lot of Canadians actually don't want to uh, move. They want to, we, we have a great country, they want to stay here. Um, and all of a sudden, that can become a lot more possible. Same time zone, same language. And um, at, at a cost that is, um, you, you take the, the, the strength of the U.S. dollar plus the differences in, in pay, certainly with larger cities, uh, that's something that we have to be thoughtful um, about as well. So there's no easy answer to this because if there isn't some element of work from home for Canadians that can remain working with Canadian companies, that competitive threat becomes even even greater, and you know I think to to what a lot of what we've been talking about, these are issues that require um, multilateral, multi um, sectoral, um, not just conversations, but actually co-creation, plan building, 
um, because it can't be done in silos. And I'm, that's something that um, even pre-COVID, because this isn't really uh, necessarily driven by COVID, uh, I don't think we're paying enough attention to that. Um, and um, that's what I would want to leave with this group is how are we going to elevate this to one of the most critical issues um, to uh, really having a labor force that's, uh, that's productive and um, that's, that's creating value economically and socially. Um, to me, the human capital is the, the, the biggest issue, uh, yet it doesn't seem to um, get the level of attention that it desires um, at all uh, across all sectors at all levels. Thanks for this. Uh, Peter, I would have liked to get to you there, but unfortunately we're up at 1.30 now, so we're going to have to uh, say goodbye to everyone here. Uh, you know, I wanted to thank everyone who tuned in to today's discussion. Again, I apologize for my camera issues, although, um, you know, I haven't had a haircut in three months, so maybe that was for the best. Um, we had a ton of questions, more than, uh, than we even were able to get around to here. Thank you for everyone that submitted them. Uh, you know, it really helped with the discussion and uh, you know, there are definitely some key themes that emerged. Um, thanks to everyone uh, who joined us on the panel, Zevin, Peter, and Dan. Um, and thank you for the, uh, the Monk School and CIFAR for, for having us as well. Have a great day, everyone.